So here are the details of that new reporting on Trump and nuclear secrets. Former President Donald Trump reportedly shared classified information about American nuclear submarines and their capabilities. Oh my God. So, some of the most protected secrets. With an Australian businessman who then allegedly shared the information with more than a dozen foreign officials, sources familiar with the matter, tell ABC News. Meanwhile, two sources tell The New York Times that Trump's disclosures potentially endangered the U.S. nuclear fleet. The businessman, Anthony Pratt, is a member at Mar-a-Lago who reportedly discussed the submarines with Trump in April 2021. Great. According to the Times, the former president revealed at least two pieces of critical information about the U.S. submarine's tactical capabilities, including how many nuclear warheads the vessels carried and how close they could get to their Russian counterparts without being detected. It's just it's just staggering. At, at what point are you a it's Russian just, agent? It's just staggering. And at what point do people stop voting for somebody who is actively and aggressively helping the Russians you either try to subvert accidentally this or just by being a but fool. But you help Russia. Sources tell ABC News that Pratt described Trump's remarks to at least 45 other people, including six journalists, 11 of his company's employees, 10 Australian officials, and three former Australian prime ministers. Why didn't you just go on the Joe Rogan show, dude? The potential disclosure was reported to special counsel Jack Smith's team. Enough, enough. This is enough. Richard Haas, how My damaging, God. how damaging is this information uh, out, outside the skiff? Let me just keep people a little bit of background here, Joe. You, know, you have levels of classification, confidential, secret, top secret. And then at the level of top secret, you have what are called compartments. And when I was in government, admittedly some time ago, you had more than a thousand compartments. And the whole idea was to restrict access to the most sensitive information to, a real, to those who literally had a need to know. Stuff dealing with intelligence dealing with submarines is among the most protected information just because of their importance uh, to American strategic deterrence, uh, to stability more, more broadly. So the idea that this kind of information was widely shared, this, uh, this is the kind of stuff, at a minimum, you strip people of their security clearances, and at worst, you prosecute them. So this is just irresponsibility on, on steroids. In addition, that it gives potentially the Russians all sorts of insights into capabilities on our part, vulnerabilities on their part. Imagine you're a friendly government, Australia in there, Israel, others. What does this do to your willingness to share sensitive information with right. us? I think this has a really chilling effect on our ability to work with our allies and partners. At the same time, it's a gift to our adversaries. And Richard, you have to put this Oof. in context, do you not, of when this took place, which is April of 2021, which is when we now know those boxes of classified documents were stuffed in every corner of Mar-a-Lago. In other words, not a one-off, exactly. a pattern. Just what I was going to say. This is, this is not an exception. Uh, this is the rule. And this is part of a, a pattern of, of irresponsibility, uh, of negligence, and essentially law-breaking. Uh, um, again, and dealing with some of the most sensitive national security uh, secrets that we own. So, Richard, the, what's the fallout now today with this revelation in the national security community? Like, how does, how does this scramble what the U.S. needs to know or protect and be aware of what, you know, Australia is an ally, but not everyone this guy spoke to may have been? Well, again, uh, if I were, I would expect foreign governments are looking at what they might have shared under the Trump presidency, trying to do a bit of a damage assessment. Yeah. Imagine if certain stuff was shared with us, read certain other countries, what might that mean? If I were in the Navy, I would be thinking about what difference does this make? What specifically, what was potentially shared if it reached the Russians? What would be the tactical or strategic consequences of that information? And, you know, I don't know. I don't have access to this information, right. Jonathan. When I was in government, I had no need to know this sort of thing. Yeah, this is really restricted to people in the military, in the intelligence community, dealing with this type of military uh, involvement. This is not you know, the average, no diplomat would have access to this. You didn't need to know it. So, Sam, the, uh, just to get on the record here, the Trump people say the story lacks proper context. Unclear <laughs> what the context <laughs> is oh my, under oh which God. you would talk about 
the capabilities <laughs> of nuclear submarines with an Australian businessman yeah. on the patio at Mar-a-Lago. Provide some context, please. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 context, the context is what was uh, uh, on the menu that night, what yeah. they're eating, the appetizers. Yeah, mm. We need to know that. <laughs> uh, no, I, I can't get by Richard's point uh, that um, if anyone else uh, lower than Trump had done this, right? Just, you know, imagine someone who had, you know, unique access to this, a staffer. Uh, and what about spilling it? Uh, we were probably looking at a prosecution, right? And this is just, you know, the double standards uh, or the different standards, I should say, that Trump has held to are not just political, right? Like, I know, I know a lot of Democrats out there saying, oh, my God, if, if Joe Biden were to have done this, if Hillary Clinton were to have done this, we would never stop hearing about this. And that's probably true, right? We, we heard forever about email servers. But the, the real double standard is, you know, Trump and people below him. Uh, and he does things that other people would be prosecuted or fired for. Uh, but he and his staff dismisses saying, well, that lacks context or, well, he's the president, he can do it and so on and so forth. And, you know, it, it's just that's what's striking to me. And maybe Richard could elaborate on that. Like, what would actually happen if a staffer, you know, was caught revealing these types of secrets? Like, how would that be uh, handled internally and by prosecutors? Oh, that, that's easy. I mean, in the short run, you'd lose all access to any classified information. You'd probably lose access to your computer and your job. You'd be, at best, you'd be on administrative lead. An investigation would be begun by the security services. At some point, it would be handed over to the, the Justice Department. And we've seen this. I mean, this is uh, this is what happens to people who are either reckless with classified information and in some cases that actively handed it over to others. This is this this is not a gray area. This is pretty black or white. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty black and white. And, and you, you look back again and look at officials who have done so far less. Look at General Petraeus, uh, which, of course, the, the, the great irony here, Willie, is General Petraeus now, one of the reasons Donald Trump said that he didn't select General Petraeus as Secretary of State is because he had classified information yeah. on his laptop. Nothing like this, nothing like nuclear secrets, wow. uh, and that he just couldn't let him be Secretary of State because it was so offensive to the other generals who were working with him. You look at Sandy Berger, uh, again, nothing close to nuclear secrets no. or nuclear war plans. Uh, you look at at, at Director Deutsch of the CIA. These are all people who, who took things that Richard, Richard, I mean, will tell you, well, well below nuclear secrets, because nuclear there secrets are, are some of the most protected secrets. Uh, you think about, let's say that um, General Mattis had leaked information or blabbed information about war plans, uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear secrets, or uh, nuclear subs. He would have been prosecuted. He probably would have spent time in jail. And that's what's so irritating about Republicans talking about double standards. Nobody, nobody has lived by a double standard like that, that is that, the, uh, and been given a wider berth than Donald Trump. And here's yet another example of it. This would send, this would send any of those people straight to jail. Yes. Yeah, and it has sent people to jail for mu for much less. And it is this bigger idea, as you say, of grading Donald Trump on a curve. Why does he get a pass on this stuff when no one else would? Why do Republicans go, oh, yeah, he said he, he thinks that General Milley should be executed. Eh, that's just him popping off. It's Donald being Donald. They've moved the window so far that they excuse almost everything. And there's an important everything. point to make here that this isn't just a fascinating story or a curiosity. This information, according to the New York Times and ABC News, intersects with Jack Smith, the special counsel's investigation, right. which may now call Anthony Pratt, this Australian businessman, as a witness in the documents case against Donald Trump, displaying further how cavalier he was with classified information around Mar-a-Lago. All, right. All right. Okay. Lawyers defending the My Lumpy Pillow guy are seeking to dump him as a client, Why? apparently because he hasn't oh. paid them. This is kind of going around theme. in Trump circles. It's a theme. It is a theme. Those attorneys are currently defending Mr. Pillow. My Lumpy Pillow founder yeah. and CEO Mike Lindell yeah. and his business against defamation claims from voting machine companies and Smartmatic and Dominion voting systems, along with a third lawsuit brought by a former Dominion employee. All three claimed their reputations were damaged by Lindell's repeated claims of fraud surrounding the 2020 presidential election. 
But now, attorneys for Lindell claim he is months behind yeah. on paying their legal bills, amounting to millions of dollars. And they say they can no longer afford to represent does, him. Does nobody, does, nobody, does nobody in this crowd understand that you get retainers from these people? I mean, because, because they don't pay. I mean, Lindell, of course, pays well, his lawyer just yesterday. Who thought they would pay? I know. It's what Brad lawyer was... thought that guy would pay his bills and yeah. Rudy Giuliani would pay his bills? Well, And quite frankly, Donald Trump, when he runs out of money. Mr. Pillow told NBC News that he would gladly keep paying them if he wasn't broke. Oh. But, of course, as my grandfather could have told him if he'd only listened to him, don't try to run a pillow business, an online pill pillow business, while you're trying to foment, uh, you know, a coup. Yeah. And, and as Willie said, in between your fried chicken and your swim in the lake, calling for martial law. Willie, that never works. Yeah. By the way, your grandfather was a visionary that he saw online shopping coming that long ago. <laughs> he did. It's just really, he did. really something. And with the pillows it was great. specifically. <laughs> this, this guy, no. Uh, b b born in like aught six, and he, he saw this coming. <laughs> All right. Wait, but by the way, so Just Mike, go. in all seriousness, Mike uh, Lindell has been sued um, by Dominion for $1.3 billion. Uh, yeah. He says he's lost $100 million because his product was pulled from stores like Bed Bath & Beyond and Walmart. He says it's cancel yeah. culture. They say, no, we don't want to be in bed with a guy who's calling for the overturning of elections and martial law right. and disparaging people. Uh, and so they have a business decision to make and they stop using the, the Mr. Pillow stuff. So he says and, that's and why he has pillows. no money to pay. But in the end, like yeah. all these guys, he's the victim. Yeah, and always the victim. By the way, let us just say, let everybody, I just want everybody to know, we've, we've never used Mr. Pillow's pillows, our slippers. No, so too lumpy. Maybe they're the best in the world. We just hear they're lumpy. I just, people say, Willie, yeah, people yeah, say they're say. lumpy. That It's like you're not just hiking the Appalachian Trail. And that's what some people say. <laughs> many people are saying, yeah. Many, many people are saying that. Anyway, there's been one poll after another poll after another poll this week that has shown that the Republicans are just absolutely uh, bashing Democrats when it comes to issues. In fact, Gallup had a poll a few days ago where they reported the largest gap between Republicans and Democrats uh, since they started taking these polls. Um, and despite the fact Republicans have a massive lead, we always go like, well, how, how, how could people still go, go along and Republicans to go along with Donald Trump? I mean, a lot of them aren't, despite the fact that Democrats are minus 20, minus 25, even minus 30, on like polls on who do you trust more to take care of the economy. Both, both parties are, are not liked or trusted by 56, 57, 58 percent of the population. And uh, Joe Biden, in, a, in the latest poll that's out, among likely voters, uh, beating Donald Trump by three points. It's amazing the advantage Republicans have, or two points, that Republicans have going in to this election on the issues. And yes. yet Donald Trump keeps dragging them down. Yeah, no, they're saddled with this Trump issue. And if they were had any other candidate there, I think there'd be real alarm among Democrats and the White House about what these polls are showing. We just ticked through one of the, that Marquette University poll we just showed there. Yes, the top line shows Trump and Biden. Biden up slightly, but within the margin of error. It's a close race. We know that. But look at this. Republicans Holy over cow. Democrats on issues like inflation, the economy, immigration. These are 25, nearly 30-point margins 30, creating 30, jobs. Yeah, it's yeah, unbelievable. Huge, huge numbers. Now, the other way, Democrats, as you might expect, more you know, trusted more on climate change, abortion policy, policy, health care, Medicare, and the like. But elections so often, Joe, as you well know, are decided on the economy. And these are big warning signs here. Uh, and, and certainly there has been some other surveys in swing state voters, particularly among suburban voters, who dislike Trump immensely, but still really disapprove of how this White House has handled the economy. And the White House thinks that can change. Yep. They point to some underlining metrics. They say things are getting better. They think that narrative will change come next year. But 
This is do something we really deeply come on? Beef. Do we really think? Do we think I'm that narrative's going to change? I'm saying that's I don't think that narrative's going to change. Sure I don't think I mean, so the economists, the economists, Willie, are still saying that, hey, uh, we may still be headed for a hard landing. The economists are still saying interest rates may continue to go up right now. I mean, the White House, I think they're starting to realize they made a really bad mistake with this Bidenomics uh, rollout. And, right. and, and reportedly, Joe Biden was against that. And and they went ahead with it anyway. It's not working. You can't convince people the economy's going great when they don't feel like the economy's going great, even though our economy is going a hell of a lot better than any other countries. Yeah, and the idea that it's just narrative doesn't work for voters either. Why aren't why aren't you listening to our story that we're telling you that things are going well? Well, because maybe in my life I think things cost too much is usually the answer you hear. And John, that was the concern when they went with the Bidenomics argument, which was Okay. Yeah, there are a lot of good things to talk about in this economy, but when you call it Bidenomics, you now own everything about the economy, and that's what Republicans are using. Right, and that rebrand hasn't worked at all to this point. And numbers can be what the numbers are, but perception is different, and voters are going to probably cast their ballots based on the perception. And immigration, another issue there that, that I know Joe hammers on a lot here is being a real problem uh, for Democrats. And we're seeing that poll reflects it. And now we're seeing a Biden administration doing a rever about face on a couple of issues about deportation of Venezuelan migrants is also construction of yeah. Donald Trump's border wall. Uh, now, some of that's because they have to because of a funding issue. But it is a right. nod that that's a vulnerability, too. And if the Republicans had anyone other than Donald Trump at the top of the ticket, there could be real, real worries. But even with Trump, this is going to be very, very close, and there are warning signs for the White House. Listen, all the internal polls that I've seen in the swing states are just really tight. Whether you're looking at Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, or Michigan, the internal polls show show these these candidates close. Not so close in Georgia. Trump is Trump actually from the internal polls I've seen. Trump is is moving ahead in Georgia right now. So a long way to go. We're just talking though about the problems right now. That, that all sides are facing. That said, because it's such a long time to go, I, I you know, the one that say, say, say here, you know, you, you can talk a year out about who you're going to vote for, who you're not going to vote for. I'm against the incumbent. But, uh, that, but when you get in that voting booth, things change. And I still think when people get in the voting booth, it's going to be hard for them to check off Donald Trump, a guy who says he wants, uh, you know, he, he, he wants the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, executed, guy that says he wants to ban TV stations that he doesn't like, a guy that said, you know, says, says the most horrific things, jokes about 82-year-old people getting their heads bashed in. Uh, but Sam Stein, one underlying issue that, again, even a week out from the 2022 races, nobody was talking about because it was showing up at 3 4 5% of the polls taking women's right to choose away. It proved to be a firestorm. And on election day, 35% of voters said that abortion was a huge issue. Things haven't gotten better since then. Ron DeSantis in the state of Florida has yeah, enacted yeah, yeah. a six week ban since the 2022 midterms. He won that huge, huge landslide. And then did and that. And then passed a six-week ban that has Republican, some of the biggest supporters uh, of, 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 of Republicans financially saying, that's way too radical. We can't go along with that. There's so many cross currents right, right now. You'd usually say it's the economy, stupid. But because of Donald Trump and because of some really extreme policies, you know, like in Michigan, swing state, an 1849 ban, um, because of abortion ban, I mean, it's leveling the playing field for Democrats when Democrats should be down 10 points. Yeah, and you know who thinks that this could be kryptonite for Republicans is Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump is out there right. publicly saying that this is a bad issue for Republicans, that they should not be uh, embracing six-week bans. Uh, he's reluctantly uh, said he would uh, embrace harsh uh, abortion legislation himself and touted the fact that he's uh, responsible for the three Supreme Court justices that ended Roe. But he's also been very upfront about what he thinks are the political costs of it, and he's moved away from it. And so, yeah, that's a factor, uh, obviously, and will be in 2024. And look, I mean, we're so far out, right? We're, what, 14 months? It's hard to just divide yeah. what's going to happen based on polls. What we have seen... Uh, which has given some Democratic op uh, optimism, is these special election results that have often seen Democrats outperform 
historical margins and expectations. Now, will that pretend anything for 2024? Who knows? Again, we're so far out. The economy could take another twist or turn. Again, I completely agree with Jonathan and Willie, like the Bidenomics rebrand, really bad, uh, to potentially fatal. Uh, you don't want to be owning an economy where people don't think that it's going well for them. Also, it centers the economy on Biden and not on the people, uh, which yep. a lot of Democrats have been worried about. Um, but we have just so much time uh, and so many different concurrent issues that I think we just need to take a, a, a bit of a breath, you know? Yeah, man. Oh, no doubt about it. We've got a lot of time. Uh, and, and I'm so glad you brought up those special elections. You look at a state like Florida. Ron DeSantis won in a landslide. Republicans won in a landslide. They won because Democrats just didn't fight. Democrats weren't in the state of Florida. It wasn't competitive. So what happened when Democrats pulled up all of their stakes, left, didn't fund the 2022 race? In 2023, there's a special election. And what happens for the first time in a long time? A Democrat wins in Jacksonville. In Jacksonville. So anything can happen, but Sam's right. We got a long way to go. But look at these special elections like the Jacksonville mayor's race. And, 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 and you see, again, that though Republicans are ahead on issues, they still are being dragged down by Donald Trump and abortion bans. All right, everybody. Meanwhile, divisions in the House appear to be stretching far beyond just the Republican Party. The Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus may lose several Republican members. They're considering quitting the group amid frustrations that Democrats did not help Kevin McCarthy keep the speakership, instead choosing to oust him and going along with every single Democrat and Matt Gates and his seven Republicans. <laughs> with us now, co-chair of the House Problem Solvers Caucus, Democratic Congressman Josh Gottheimer, of New Jersey. Congressman, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah. I will ask you uh, here. Thank you so morning. much. Thank you so much for, for coming. Sorry I couldn't uh, sorry couldn't talk to you yesterday, uh, but so great to be able to talk to you today. Um, a lot of people like myself are asking, if you have a Problem Solvers Caucus, wouldn't that be a great time for the Problem Solvers to figure out how to stop the House of Representatives from vacating the chair for the first time in American history? What do you say? Well, listen, I, I think if you looked at this challenge, we had one, we had uh, uh, Speaker McCarthy, and we were eager to find a way forward. I'm sure you saw what uh, what the Speaker said, that he ultimately, quote, didn't want to sell his soul to Democrats and that he wouldn't ask for any deal from anything from Democrats. So, you know, it's, it's hard to do a deal with someone who doesn't want to engage, but we certainly tried, and that's, of course, the Speaker's right and, and his decision to make. Um, but, but certainly, if you look at the work we did in the last months, it's all about bipartisan governing and whether it was the debt ceiling deal, which we worked on together, or of course, avoiding the government shutdown this weekend. That's where bipartisanship, I think, showed exactly the power of it. Yeah, and I now, mean, you guys did that, and, but, and but now, I mean, right? this, this is like a big thing. I mean, history books will talk about this, a house in such dysfunction that yeah, but, but John, without a speaker really gotta, I mean, for the I, first time, for I, the first time in, in American history. And again, you guys didn't have to support Kevin McCarthy. And by the way, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, you, you could have voted present. It, it just seems to me that you were told by Hakeem Jeffries that all Democrats had to fall in line. And instead of being a problem solver, you just fell in line with the rest of the Democratic Party. Is that an unfair well, assessment? Well, that, that is totally, uh, I think, not, not a fair picture at all what happened. One, as I just said, we tried to figure out a way forward where we can encourage more bipartisanship on the floor, allow more of Democratic parties to get to the floor. And, and of course, I think we would have um, uh, found a way forward with, with the speaker. He wasn't interested in that, so it's very hard to, to do that and under those circumstances. And again, that was his decision. But secondly, you know this, Joe, because you were there. Picking the speaker is a family decision based in the respective caucuses. In this case, of course, the Republicans are in the majority. That's their family dinner. I'm not invited to that. They make their decision. When you were in Congress, I don't think you were voting for Dick Gephardt. Uh, and I'm sure if I, when I asked my Republican colleagues, hey, would you vote for Nancy Pelosi in exchange for literally nothing uh, to help right, you? But you're a problem, problem solver. You're, you're, not, you're, not, you're, now, you're, you're now talking like you're, you're a problem solver. You're in a problem solver's caucus. You're now talking, though. You're now talking like you're now talking like a partisan when you're saying it's a family business. I'm sure that. Uh, no, I there were several times I crossed. Uh, the aisle several so times you, and, and, you, and, 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 you're, and you, you stood up and didn't vote for Newt Gingrich. I mean, let me be, let's be clear about this. The decision of speaker, as you know, as we're seeing right now, is a decision made in a respective caucus. I'm not in that room. That's a caucus, a respective caucus right. decision of the majority party. 
However, if you look at the record of actual bipartisanship when it comes to policy matters, we're always at the table. I'm working right now on two things. We're working with a group of us. One, to make sure we don't shut the government down in 38 days and make sure we protect our veterans and our families and our seniors, right, which I think is absolutely critical to avoid that right. shutdown. And also, I think we need to come together and change the rules of the House so that one person can vacate the chair. By the way, this is a fight I had several years ago with the Problem Solvers Caucus. We came together and changed the rules. And then, of course, Ken McCarthy, you know, I, I understand Matt Gates insisted upon this, change it back to a one vote to vacate the chair. I think we need to change that back, but that's mm -hmm. going to take us coming together and, of course, ensuring that we as Democrats and find yeah. more ways to get parties to the table and work in a bipartisan manner. That's well, how so, Washington. So, uh, again, it, it sounds like together. you're saying it sounds like you're saying I'm a problem solver, except on, on, on the biggest issue of all. And let me just say, if 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 my if my choice was voting for Dick Gephardt, um, or empowering um, a, a, a radical uh, on, on the left that is equivalent of the radicals on the right, I would have voted for Dick Gephardt because I would say I'm not turning this house over to freaks. I'm not because it's about being an institutionalist. I will say it's like John Roberts. John Roberts, I'm sure, didn't want to go along with the Affordable Care Act, but he was not going to overturn the Affordable Care Act because it would have undermined the institution of the Supreme Court of the United States. So I, I, I understand why I understand. And, and by the way, we so you, so you were not, you were OK. Let me finish what I'm saying. Let me let me finish what I'm saying. Let me finish what I'm saying. We not Kevin McCarthy around all the time. I want to make sure people don't don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. But the question is, and I don't know what I would have done if I were in your position. I, I don't know. I, I probably would have voted the way you voted. But I'm still asking the question. What's more important, the institution or Kevin McCarthy's gross failings as a leader? So I think, one, you have to look, put the blame here where, where it goes, which is the extreme eight in his own party who refused to support him. I mean, like, we got to put that on the table, and leaving that out is a glaring thing. And secondly, I, I was very willing and worked to try to find a, a deal that we could work together where we can get more bipartisan priorities to the floor with the speaker. And as he said, after the vote, and you can't leave this out, he said, quote, he didn't want to sell his soul to Democrats. So in his mind, working together for the institution was not worth, it was it, the price of having to work with Democrats on more bipartisan governing, getting more bipartisan priors to the floor, wasn't worth it for him. Again, I don't begrudge him that, that's his decision. But to leave that out of this discussion is slightly ridiculous. He said he wouldn't ask for any deal or anything from Democrats. You can't work on something with somebody who doesn't want to work with you. And that's a very difficult thing, right. and you know that, right? So it wasn't as if we didn't try. I tried for days, a group of us tried for weeks to try to find a deal that was his decision. And again, I don't begrudge him that. And I also understand in the Problem Starts Caucus, we have a phenomenal group of Democrats and Republicans, incredible people. We're going to keep working together. This is a high emotional time. We need now to focus on the most important thing, making sure our government doesn't shut down in 38 days and hurt our veterans and our families and our children and our seniors. That's the most important priority. And we also need to change the rules of the House. But that, again, is going to take both sides coming together, both sides giving a little to encourage more bipartisan governing. And that's how this place, as you know, works. That's how we did it this weekend to avoid a government shutdown. It's how we kept we avoided the debt ceiling crisis and worked right. together on that. How we got infrastructure done, veterans, PACT Act done, chips done, right? The electoral reform done that I worked on with Susan no. Collins. You did it by actually no. both sides giving a little, and you can't leave that out, Joe, of the the question you're asking me, which well, is, I, I, should I, the other I, side I, give I, or not? I'm, I'm not leaving that out. And I, I talk all the time about how there's been more bipartisan compromise over the past couple of years and then, than there's been for most of this century. So I'm not leaving that out at all. I think I think we, 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 we what we keep talking past each other on is you keep talking about Kevin McCarthy not wanting to deal with the Democrats. Mm -hmm. And what I'm asking is if he's acting like an idiot, do you do you focus on the idiot or do you focus on the institution? I would suggest that as you approach this, and again, I may have voted the way you voted if I were in your position. So, I, so again, many different things to so many different things to consider. He's done so many offensive things. <laughs> uh, so, but the question is, do you focus on the idiot or do you focus on the institution? It doesn't really matter well, if Kevin McCarthy wants to deal with question. Democrats or not. 
I'm sorry, go ahead. It's a great question, and I would say it's a great question. I think the institution is bigger than Kevin McCarthy or any individual speaker. And now, and that, that would be my answer on that. It's bigger than that, and you need to find a partner you can work with. And now the key, I think, we like you can look back all you want. I'm looking forward. we got to change the rules of the House to make sure that one person can vacate the chair. It's what we actually had before. The Problem Solvers Caucus are the ones who actually changed that rule. It was changed back, bowing to the extremists in this Congress. That's the key. And also working together to avoid a government shutdown. That has to be our focus. Right. It's what I'm already talking to my colleagues about. And we're going to work together and get that done. That's our number one job right now. Do you think the Republicans, some of the Republicans are going to quit? No, I don't think so. I think, listen, people are upset, and, and I get that. You should yeah. have seen the conversation after January 6th. There were some very hot, emotional conversations, rightly so, right? This is what yeah. happens. People, of course, feel strongly about it, but our job, we don't agree on everything, and the problems are as caucus, you know, but what we try to do is talk through it, work through it together, and then figure yeah. out how we can get a solution that most of us agree upon. And if, and if a few yeah. folks... You know, leave, and that's what they they're choosing. I totally respect them for that. But I'm very confident, yeah. based on my conversations the last couple of days, that we will get back yeah. in the room and work on the issues that are critical to the country. All, All right. right. All right, Josh. Thank you so much. Thank and you. you know, thanks I, for coming. You on. know, I, I I appreciate and I respect what you do. Uh, really grateful you. for you to come in on today. And again, for viewers that are watching, going, "Oh, Joe's there." Now, I don't know what I would do. I don't have the voting card. I didn't go through this day in and day out like Josh did and like other members did. We're just asking the question. And Josh, I, I, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. And uh, I hope you come back soon. Anytime. I guess TJ TJ oh, just pressed no, the button. No, he was there. The there. There's a delay. There he is. Okay. There's a delay. There's a delay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Josh. Jim Jordan knew more about what Donald Trump had planned for January 6th than any other member of the House of Representatives. And if the Republicans decide that Jim Jordan should be the Speaker of the House, um, there will, and I, by the way, I don't think that's going to happen. I think he'll lose. But if they were to decide that, there would no longer be any possible way to argue that a group of elected Republicans could be counted on to defend the Constitution. Former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney with that take on a possible Jim Jordan speakership. We've got a lot to talk about, and we're going to be getting to that David Ignatius column. David went to Kiev. Uh, a, a tough column, tough questions that the people of Ukraine are asking themselves right now. We'll get to that in a little bit. First, Donnie, speaking of branding, I'd love to, to pass by you uh, this latest poll. It came out yesterday. The New York Post uh, caught my attention reading uh, the the newspaper of record for Morning Joe, the New York Post. And uh, they ran this. It was a Marquette Law uh, poll. Very good poll. Has Joe Biden ahead of Donald Trump among likely voters, which is the voter group you look to, uh, 51 to 49 percent? So you got that, right? Now look at the issues and where the parties stand on the issues. The Democratic brand is so battered right now on inflation, Trump beating Biden mm -hmm. by 23 percent on the economy. Be I mean, it's the economy stupid. Not always, because Trump is beating Biden on the economy 24 percent. On immigration and border security, 24 percent. On creating jobs, 19 percent. On foreign relations, 5 percent. Then it gets tighter. Uh, Biden wins on Medicare, Social Security, on abortion policy and on climate change. But you look at those top issues, inflation, the economy, uh, creating jobs. Uh, you know, Carville famously said, it's the economy, stupid. And yet you look at, again, the overall, Donnie. Um, we can get off that slide now. Thank you. You look at the overall and Biden's ahead. And this is what Republicans on the Hill understand. This is what Republicans off the Hill understand. This is what Republican fundraisers understand. That they're actually, that the Democratic brand is actually more beaten up than the Republican brand. If you look at the issues, but you look at a Gallup poll that shows the same thing here. And then you see that both parties right now are loathed. 56, 57, 58 percent of Americans disapprove of both parties. Uh, so it just seems to me, again, the Republican brand is so dragged down by Donald Trump.
and yet they just don't seem to get it. The base doesn't seem to get it. I'd be amazing, you know, to see poll. We've seen polls also in the past with Nikki Haley, where she's up five points, and uh, some of the other candidates. If they had anybody else there, they, they'd be, they would be way, way up. It's, it's, it's not even a question. The issue becomes, what do the Democrats do? Uh, and, and I think the answer is in, in why is their brand so why is their brand so bad, Donnie? I mean, you you look. I, I I understand Bidenomics wasn't the way to go, but I could show you a lot of things that show that. Our military is stronger relative to the rest of the world than ever before. We get, once again, leading in NATO. NATO is expanding stronger than ever. Uh, jobs, uh, you want a job, there's a job out there for you. What's happening? Is inflation, which seems to be going down, is inflation really that much of a drag on Biden and the economy? It's two things. I, I think it's, uh, from an issue point of view, I do think inflation is the one. It's hard to find anything else. And I'm going to say something else that, that's hard to say. I think it's Biden. A lot of it is Biden. He's just, we've talked a lot about he does not come across as inspiring and strong. And we see the poll after poll uh, that he comes across as, as old. And I, 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 I hate this because I think he's a good man and I think he's been an effective president. But for whatever the reason in, in, the, in this telegenic world we live in, I don't think he's inspiring. I think it's hurting the brand. He's our guy. We're going to get behind him. But that's my honest answer. And, and Richard, a really important issue as you look at that poll is immigration. And I think it appears yesterday, at least, the, the Biden administration with a couple of new things, the announcement that they are going to allow up to 20 new miles of Donald Trump's border wall to be completed. They say they have to do that legally for budget reasons, not their choice. Also, that they're going to deport Venezuelan migrants as well. Waking up to the fact that the crisis at the border is not some pet Fox News issue, that it's impacting everybody in this country. And he's hearing it. The, the president is from the mayor of New York City, very vocally in the last few days, from the governor of Illinois, both Democrats, that this is a real problem that is affecting their towns. Yeah, the administration has been so out of step with the country on this and so slow to realize that this is a major problem and it is not just Fox, it is across the country. And as you say, Democrats are pushing back because they have to govern and they, this is not an abstraction now. And the, but the administration policy will, yes, they've made some small steps, more wall, we're going to deport some people, but it's truly incoherent. You just let in 480,000 Venezuelans and put them on temporary protected status. So now you're going to start sending them back. But how, how many? If you have temporary protected status, that means people can work. That's still a magnet to come here. Look, the administration can't quite decide what its immigration policy is. And what worries me, besides that it's overwhelming cities and the, polit the politics of this, it's discrediting immigration. This is a country that immigration has been part of our story, part of our greatness. And what this is doing is raising across the political spectrum the sense that immigration is illegitimate. It's illegal. We have got to get to the point where we control our borders, but we have a large legal immigration program for people who need to come here for humanitarian reasons. We also need it for economic reasons. This, this is, the administration is still, it's one step in the right direction. They got a long ways to go. So, John, were these two moves, which is Richard say, really just affect on the margins, the crisis that's happening there? Are these a first acknowledgement, at least, from the Biden administration about the extent of the problem at the border? There's been a, a it's been fits and starts. Uh, of course, when the Trump era pandemic asylum restriction ended, the White House fought to keep that in place, and then that lifted. Now we have this. But there is a growing knowledge, though, of the political problem here. I think what happened this week that was interesting, Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, has been complaining about this for a while. The White House has largely dismissed him because he seeks attention and such. But Governor Pritzker of Illinois, the, the, his weight, his words seem to carry more weight. He's a close Biden ally. He also, you know, Chicago in Illinois is hosting the convention next year. Uh, we've got some reporting from Julia Ainsley from Chicago that we're going to show later in the show about how the migrant issue has become really an issue. And, and Joe, the poll reflects it there, that this is something that Americans have, are concerned about. And it's partially in big blue cities, Democratic strongholds, the kind of places where this president is going to need to turn out as many voters as possible next year. Right. You know, we've, we've, we've heard about immigration and border security being an issue in 2018. It ended up not being an issue. We heard it in 2020 and 2022 ended up not being an issue. I don't know if it's going to be a political issue in 2024. I do know that a lot of Americans like me have been concerned about it for a long time and concerned about it. Uh, not because I'm anti-immigrant. I agree with Ronald Reagan. We are a nation of immigrants. Immigrants make us vital. They need to come here legally. And, and, and from, from 
you know, we saw, we saw with Barack Obama at the end of Barack Obama's term, uh, the lowest number of illegal border crossings in 50 years. Things have gotten worse since then, and they continue to get worse year after year after year. Uh, and so what I, what I want to understand, though, Peter Baker, is, <clears throat> is explain to me the dynamics of why the White House uh, keeps falling over themselves on this issue. Why, why are they, why, as Richard says, they seem to be hung up. They don't exactly know which way to go. Why can't they? put somebody in charge and say the first thing we're going to do is we're going to stop the massive flow of immigrants coming into the United States. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure there are officials that process this. The next thing we're going to do is really work aggressively towards raising the limits of illegal immigrants. Why can't they have that sort of approach? Yeah, I mean, look, what you see is obviously a stutter step approach. I think John Lindemir just said it right. I mean, sometimes it's fitful. Uh, Secretary Blinken right now is in Mexico talking to, to the government there. You see these moves in terms of the wall, in terms of uh, Venezuelans. But I, it doesn't have the sense of urgency in this White House. You don't hear the president talk about this. You don't hear his top aides talk about this on a regular basis. It's not an issue that uh, commands their attention like Ukraine or others that they focus on. And I think part of that is the hangover from the Trump era, which is not a, a, an era that's necessarily over, in which in, immigration has been inflamed. It has been turned into such a divisive issue. And that's something that Biden hates. I think he hates what he thinks uh, Donald Trump did to immigration, turning it into an us versus them uh, issue, uh, playing off of racial animus, and therefore any move that seems to, to, to you know, restrict immigration, right. legal, uh, illegal immigration becomes tarnished by that brush in that sense. And so I think they struggle to find, you know, a rational approach that doesn't seem to play into what they believe are racist uh, stereotypes. Good with words. And I'm not very good with words. And I let all my expressions and my love and my pain and my anger come out with my, my melodies. I had someone to write my words for me, and without him, the journey would not have been possible. I kind of feel cheating standing up here accepting this, because without Bernie, there wouldn't have been any Elton John at all. And I would like him to come up, and I would like to give this to him. A remarkable moment of the 1994 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductions. That was music icon Elton John, of course, honoring the man whose words gave life to his melodies, Bernie Taupin. From a farmhouse in the English countryside to the glitzy heights of rock and roll stardom, Taupin's journey is as remarkable as the lyrics he penned. And this November, Bernie is set to join the ranks of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for his musical excellence. With us now to talk about his memoir, Scattershot, Life, Music, Elton, and Me, and of course, it's long overdue honor, the English songwriter and lyricist, the one and only Bernie Taupin. Bernie, thank you so much for being here. Good morning. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. I, I feel like I should be wearing the T-shirt the, the that Stella McCartney wore when they inducted Paul McCartney into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I can't use all of the words here, but it said about <laughs> blanking time. Yeah, I got it. I got to say, <laughs> I I gotta say, Bernie, I was absolutely shocked when I was reading your book to find out you weren't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's crazy. Well, I think you probably join a large group of people there, but um, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that certain individuals felt that because Elton had given me his award, that automatically made me a member of the Hall of Fame. So I think there was some resistance over the years. But, hey, that's all water under the bridge. I'm happy to join the club. There's so many song songs I want to ask you about. But first, I want to talk about this book. What was it like sitting down, staring at, at blank sheets of paper? and saying, OK, I'm going to write about myself now. I mean, the main thing that I, I felt was that I did not want to write a linear sort of memoir. I didn't want it to be A to Z. That would have pretty much bored me, I think. Uh, and besides, I'm, I'm not very good at recollections of times and dates and where things land in my sort of story. And I felt it was more interesting to just 
uh, head into things at, a, at any particular point in time. Whatever happened to sort of fall into my lap that particular day I was writing. Like my songs, everything came very quickly. It was like being on the couch yeah. and sort of uh, psychoanalyzing myself for my entire life. And I think at uh, 73 years old, it seems like a good time to reminisce, wouldn't you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, I need to do that myself. So I was so excited to hear about the book because I grew up with you, but I really didn't know that much about you until I opened up this book. But I really, I was always curious about your relationship with Elton John and your songwriting relationship, because, you know, you hear about Lennon and McCartney and that, you know, these guys were stuck in a hotel room together for six years. They were together all the time. It's just the opposite with you and your songwriting partner. I love the imagery. You said the coin was flipped, but we were opposite sides of the coin. T talk about talk about that, how you how once things blew up, you kind of went your separate ways. Well, uh, as the old adage goes, I mean, opposites attract, but in the early days, we were joined at the hip. We were writing in his mother's apartment in the years between 1967 and 1971. I mean, even after we came to the United States in 1970 and sort of played at the Troubadour and everybody thought we exploded then, I mean, there was a lot of work to come after that. I mean, we went back from the Troubadour to England, back to our bunk beds in his mother's apartment. And, and it was like a mini Brill building. We would, be, I'd be writing sort of lyrics in the in the bedroom, and he'd be in the front room at the stand up piano, hammering out melodies. And that's how we started out. And but as time went on, you know, and we sort of developed our own individual lives, you know, we we did split apart. But the the music still bound us, and we were still the best of friends as we are to this day. If you will tell the story about your song. I mean, you wrote this song that people will be singing the words to long after we're both gone. You wrote it like in, a, in like 15 minutes. It takes some people longer to eat a ham sandwich than it took you to write the lyrics to an eternal classic. Well, you know, it's interesting if you've seen the movie or if your listeners or viewers have seen the movie Rocket Man, the one, although that movie for the most part is very much a fantasy, there are several scenes in it that are very realistic and true to life. And the scene in that when we're in Elton's apartment having breakfast and I'm sort of scribbling some lyrics and I hand them to him and he says, these have got egg on them. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened. And that's so right on. It was almost just thoughts from a very, very naive individual on sort of a, a, his ro romantic aspirations. And that's why it has all those sort of pregnant pauses in it that makes it a little bit more quirky than the normal love ballad. And um, Elton just took it and took it into the next room. And as it shows in the movie, sort of came up with the melody very quickly. So um, that's, it's, it's not particularly interesting. I mean, that's how it happened. And the fact that it's yeah. become sort of this universal classic is is uh, icing on the cake, I guess. I, I was blown away by this story. I've always thought of that 74 concert where John Lennon and Elton John are on stage as just a magical moment. But you, you, play, you played a big role in getting John Lennon out on stage. Could you tell everybody about that? Well, the thing is that a lot of people sort of query the fact that John was nervous about going on. They say, well, that can't have been possible because, you know, he was at the height of the Beatles that played Shea Stadium. They did this. But people don't realize that John had not been on stage for years. And it was right. a whole different ball game at that particular time. He was absolutely petrified to go on and insisted that I go on with him, which was quite ridiculous, you know, that, as Elton <laughs> said in his book, even even a, a, a Beatle couldn't uh, get me to go on stage. So I literally had to propel him onto the stage. And once he was out there and heard the the response of the audience, which to this day I've never heard anything like it. I mean, it was beyond 
beyond imagination. And ultimately, in the end, I did come on with him because when he came off, he pulled me onto the stage and I had no choice. It was probably one of the highlights of my life to be part of that. Speaking of your life, you've done so many other things. Talk about what you've done, the art and ranch work and everything that you've done on the side has held your interest in some ways as much or even more than being a lyricist. Well, yeah, the thing is that I think people think that I, as they obviously know me most as a songwriter, and they think that that's probably something that I do 24 hours a day, you know, 24 7. And that's so not the case. I have a lot of downtime, but I, I've managed to fill that downtime with, with other endeavors and have done. I've made my own records, I've had my own band. I'm, you know, I, I'm a visual, I'm a relatively successful visual artist, and I also ranched for many years and cowboyed and, and sort of lived a completely different life. Wow. So, but yeah. as Duke Ellington said, everybody should do more than one thing, and I've I've done way more than one thing. Other than the fact that you can now put on your mini list of accomplishments, New York Times best-selling author. What what are you the proudest of uh, when, when you look at this entire experience of Scattershot? What, what's given you uh, the most joy? Well, the fact that I can put it all of the the joy and the, the heartache and, and my entire career to be able to chronicle it into one book and then have it be a bestseller. I think that's probably the high point because it encompasses everything I've done. And the fact that people are buying the book and enjoying it is is probably one of the high points of my life, if not the high point of my life. It, it, it is uh, it's a fantastic book, especially like fans uh, like me that have followed you for so long, but didn't know all about you. So thank you so much uh, for, for, for being with us today. I greatly appreciate it. Great honor. Thank you. And I appreciate you having me.